well. Yeah. And, uh, I want to welcome you here to New Beginnings for our Easter service, our live stream service. Pray you're all doing well in your Easter pajamas watching uh, the uh, online service here. Uh, it's, it's good to know that we can stay uh, connected this way. I uh, just want to say how much uh, we miss you, but we're glad that we can minister to you in this way. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for um, dying for us, uh, for taking our sins upon you, Lord, and then uh, being raised from the dead, Lord, and because you live, we live also, and we thank you for that. I thank you we can celebrate victory over anything, Lord, because you won the great victory over death and the grave. I pray, Father, for everyone here, Lord, anybody who may be struggling uh, in uh, any health issues, Lord, that you would send your healing graces to touch them uh, by your healing power, Lord. I just thank you for everyone who's listening and pray your richest blessing on them uh, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Worship you.
weapon.
never come your way. Jesus will always be your way. Amen. 
Yeah, when Beth just said that, that it's finished, I, I really felt yes. that yeah. we make that declaration yes. that this yes. pandemic is finished. Yes. We've heard words that this was going to be ending uh, on Easter Sunday. Yeah. And and I just really felt uh, the spirit on that, Beth, that just, it is finished. Amen. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's been this mighty attack on everybody in this nation, um, around the world, what am I saying? 184 countries are experiencing this. And um, just to pray for everyone who's uh, trapped or feels trapped in this thing, that you know that you have freedom in Christ. And uh, one other prayer request, uh, Mike Malloy was sharing that Mari's sister is in uh, Temple University Hospital and she's on a respirator with this. So uh, let's, what was her name? Lydia. Lydia, let's pray for uh, Mari's sister, uh, uh, Mari's sister, uh, Lydia. Father, we just lift up Lydia. Yes, and we just ask, Lord, for a miracle for her, Lord. Yes, new lungs, uh, new uh, yes, uh, freedom uh, yes, from this uh, attack in her lungs now, Father. And I just pray uh, health and healing to her body in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. Well, let's uh, get into the word today. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, from Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse uh, 19 through verse 22. But let's pray. Father, thank you for your living word, Lord. This word is alive, and I pray that it would come alive in the hearts of everyone who hears, Lord, of what great things you have accomplished for your people. So, Father, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, Lord, to receive these life-giving truths that can set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning, it, beginning with verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. I just love the points that the writer of Hebrews is making in this thing, that, that we actually now have a passport into the very presence of God, and that's Jesus Christ himself. He is that new and living way. But it said that he accomplished this through his blood. You know, it wasn't uh, a, a minor thing for God to send his son to die for our sins. I mean, he had a whole system of revealing himself to the people of the nation of Israel. Number one, about his holiness and how holy he was. And number two, about the, the, uh, the penalty and power of sin in our lives. So it was important for God to keep those two things before the people of the Old Testament. His holiness and their sin. And he used uh, uh, different ways to communicate this. One was through the sacrificial system uh, with the tabernacle, and the other one was uh, just how uh, insufficient uh, the blood of bulls and goats were to really bring us home into the presence of God. Um, when you look at uh, how God revealed his presence to the people of Israel, it was through the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And this was no small thing when God wanted to reveal his holiness that way. Because you begin to see, you know, that he had strict guidelines on approaching him. And, and the high priest once a year could only go into the Holy of Holies and put, apply the blood on the mercy seat, which was the seat at the top of the ark with the, with the cherubim there. They applied the blood for the atonement for the nation of Israel. And... Again, like I said, he was trying to communicate two things, his holiness and the people's sin through this whole process. And I just want to highlight how, how holy God is. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with the story in 1 Samuel. What happened was the Philistines used to attack the nation of Israel often. I mean, it was like constant, you know. But this one time when the Philistines were prevailing, uh, they decided to take the Ark of the Covenant from uh, the tabernacle and bring it out basically to the battlefield. Well, that was not the way to treat the holiness of God. But what happened was the Philistines captured the ark. And they brought it into their own temple. 
And this is how powerful the holiness of God is. They had a, a, a god, an idol called Dagon. And they set the Ark of the Covenant right in the temple with Dagon. So in the morning when the Philistines came to the temple, the statue had fallen down and its, its hands had like broken off, you know. So they, they put the statue back up. And the next day they came back. And here the statue had fallen over again and its head had fallen off. And they realized, hey, we're in trouble here. The holiness of God is still in something. All of a sudden, they started breaking out with boils and tumors, and there was all this trouble going on. And they wanted to get rid of it because they couldn't bear the holiness of God in their midst. So they sent the Ark of the Covenant back to the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it came into a, uh, a town called uh, Beth Shemesh. And uh, the people saw it coming on this cart, and they took the Ark of the Covenant down, and they did a very foolish thing. They took the lid off mm. to take a look inside. I don't know if you ever saw the, uh, the movie uh, Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark. You know, you see that ending scene where they take the lid off and then all this chaos. Well, it's kind of what happened, you know, there in this town of Beth Shepherds. They take the lid off and look inside. All of a sudden, God's judgment falls on them for violating the holiness of God. And 50,000 People died mm -hmm. because they were transgressing the holiness of God. Okay, and he had strict guidelines. It was you know the blood only could be applied by the high priest once a year. They just basically said, "Let's take a look inside. We want to see Aaron's rod. We want to see the the uh, the tablets and the manna that were in there and all this stuff." But chaos resumed. They put the lid back on and they moved it to another town. But that was an example, again, again, you're talking about how holy God was and, and what sin was about. And the only thing that could bridge the gap between God's holiness and man's sinfulness was the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ himself. Amen. Amen. So that's where he talks about in Hebrews, it's a new and living way, by the blood of Jesus. Only his blood was sufficient to declare you and me and everybody else in the human race righteous before him. You know, his blood was, was designed to bring us close to him. That was to his design from the beginning in the garden, that he would have fellowship with mankind. You know, in, in this time with this pandemic, we're practicing something called social distancing. That's why there's a handful of people here, and you're all watching this online because we are practicing social distancing. Well, there's no social distancing with God. Okay, he's the complete opposite of social distancing. He said, let us draw near, yes. okay? Let us come close to him. You know, he tells a, a parable in the New Testament Jesus did about uh, a landowner who wanted to give a banquet and he sent out invitations to all these people and they all gave excuses why they didn't want to come. And you know what? We all have a good excuse, don't we? Every excuse we need or think of that keeps us from coming to God in our minds is a good excuse. You know, I'm too busy. These are the kind of excuses uh, that they brought back to the landowner. I, I just got married. I bought some land. And I got some uh, a couple head of oxen I want to try out. I mean, all of our excuses are good. But this is what God wants. He doesn't want our excuses. He wants you. You know, so Jesus, or the parable uh, ends with the uh, landowner saying, compel people to come in. I want my house filled. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want social distancing. I want a full house. Mm -hmm. You know, the father and the son wanted many, many sons and many brethren to fill the house. So God is interesting, interested for you and I to draw near, and we can draw near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's welcome back to the human race. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again. Jesus Christ is God's welcome mat to the human race to come home. We have no excuse for not coming, okay? And if you think it's about your righteousness, you've missed it. It's about his righteousness. Yes. And he has now justified you. And that means just as if I never sinned. How about that? Yes. Just as if you've never sinned. I'll sign me up for some of that, okay? You know, as I was talking about, we live in a world now of social distancing. God is the complete opposite. He wants to get so close, he breathed on his disciples. After the resurrection, and this is Easter Sunday, 
He appears to his disciples and he gets real close and he breathes on them. We don't want anybody to breathe on us. Everybody's walking around with masks on because we don't want anybody, you know, sneezing, breathing, or anything else around us. God forbid somebody coughs around you. Well, Jesus comes to his disciples and he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. They're all born again. They're all filled now with him. And the amazing thing is this. He keeps telling them how close he wants to come. You know, he said to them after he breathed on them, I want you guys to hang out in Jerusalem after I'm gone. Okay, and I want you to wait for the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you see on Pentecost Sunday, which we're going to be coming up to soon, it said what happened was the sound of a violent rushing wind came into that upper room and they were all filled now, baptized mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit. And that word wind is the word breath. Again, God is breathing on the human race. Mm -hmm. So we have to get infected with Jesus. Can you say amen to somebody? Amen. I, want, I want to have a full-blown case of Jesus running through my body. <laughs> you know. <laughs> get contaminated with him, his love, his spirit. Uh, get it all. Let him breathe on you. There's no social distancing with our God. Um, in the uh, New Testament, uh, when uh, God revealed himself as not only uh, welcoming all the Jews, but also the Gentiles, um, there was a kind of debate, you know, should the Gentiles become Jews? What's the problem? You know, what are we trying to do here? And in Acts 15, uh, they had a little conference there, and James at the end, when they were debating this thing, said, look, let's not put uh, any restrictions on the, on the Gentiles that we couldn't even fulfill in our own lives as Jews. We can't keep the law anymore. It's not about the law, it's about Jesus, okay? It's through, through his flesh that we enter in. And uh, James makes an interesting thing. He said, we're in an age where we are restoring the fallen tabernacle David, the fallen tabernacle of David. Now, you have to understand, if you're, if you're familiar with the tabernacle in the wilderness, you know, how there was the outer court, you know, there was the, uh, the holy place and the holy of holies, and there was all these levels of worship. You know, you were restricted in certain places. You know, there were certain things that could happen only in the holy place, and then there was the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Well, what happened was, when David became king, he went down and he brought the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. And when he got there, he didn't build the tabernacle. He just built a tent where he could just go in and sit before the presence of God himself. I mean, this was a total violation of everything that they had experienced before in, in temple and, and tabernacle worship. But what it was, it was a picture. I believe David was the New Testament man in the Old Testament, okay? And he would go in every day and just sit in the very presence of God himself. And he would have singers and worshipers in there. And it was a picture of what God wanted for man. That kind of closeness. Mm -hmm. Now that's why James said, what we're experiencing now is the restoration of the fallen tabernacle of David where you can have constant, uh, confident access to the very presence of God day and night. You know, his light is always on. Remember that thing with Motel 6? You know, we'll leave the light on for yes, you. Yes. Well, the light's on for us every day to come into the very presence of God. And that's what the tabernacle of David was all about, was having constant, confident access to the very presence of God. I want to talk about another story of the, uh, uh, the resurrection that really uh, grips my heart. Um, it's about the two disciples in Luke's Gospel who were on the road to Emmaus. Maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, these two guys are a little disheartened because they saw the crucifixion. They thought everything was done. They had no hope. So Jesus joins them as they're walking to Emmaus. And I love this story because uh, Jesus comes up to them and says, Hey, what are you guys talking about? You know, you seem a little bit uh, upset. And they turn to him and they say, are you the only one in town who doesn't know what's going on, what happened? Now, here's a right. Jesus is the only one who knows what's going on. Yeah. 
And yet he's playing along with them. I just love how, how Jesus can be like that. You know, tell me, what are you guys upset about? You know, oh, hey, we're, we thought Jesus was the answer. He said, really? And then here's the amazing thing. He keeps walking with them. You know, this is the, the picture of, I think, how Jesus wants to be with us. Easy to get along with, easy to walk with, you know, easy to fellowship with. And then he has a Bible study with him, which tells me one thing. That God wants to have a Bible study with you. Yeah. That he wants to answer your questions. I mean, these guys had some real hard questions. We thought he was the answer. Maybe you thought something that happened in your life was the answer. Mm -hmm. Maybe the circumstances was the answer. Maybe the new job was the answer. Maybe the new relationship was the answer. And all of a sudden, it wasn't the answer. And you don't know what to do with that. Okay, That's what these guys were for. We thought this was the answer. Now what do I do? Give our, your hopes uh, all poured into something and it all blows up in your face? Can you say amen to anybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, at that point, you know, that's the time to talk to Jesus. That's the time to say, Lord, I don't know what happened. It certainly doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe you can make sense of it. And in this story, it said he began to open their minds. And that's the thing. We need revelation. When it looks like only Good Friday is in your life, you need a real revelation of Easter Sunday. Yes. You need a real revelation of the resurrection in your life. And that's what Jesus began to do. He began to open their understanding from the law, uh, the prophets, you know, about how um, Jesus was supposed to suffer these things, how this was part of God's plan. But it wasn't his plan to end on Good Friday. His plan was Easter Sunday and yes. the resurrection. Yes. So you and I can enter into his presence by a new living yes. way. Yes. And then Jesus keeps walking them. And it looks like he was going to go farther. And they said, no, no, please stay for dinner. Hang out with us even more. And guess what? He did. Yes. You know, that's a great thing. Jesus wants to be your guest all the time. So they go in. Uh, they start having a, a meal together. And it said he revealed himself through the breaking of the bread. Now, I don't know how he did this. But I'm trying to imagine how it happened. Whether when he broke the bread, they saw the nail prints in his hands. And all of a sudden, when they saw that, they realized who they had been with. And it said he disappeared at that moment. And then they all ran back. The guys, they ran back to Jerusalem. And they told, you know, the apostles, hey, we've just seen the Lord on the road to, to Emmaus. But, you know, when you read that story, you get a fresh revelation of how easy it is to walk with Jesus, to talk with him, to process your losses, your frustrations, your pains. This is what he wants to do in your life. You know, by all means, talk to him. You know, he came for you to do this. You know what I love about Mary Magdalene after the resurrection? Well, first of all, she, she was the only one who hung around the garden tomb after the, she saw it was empty. But when she actually saw Jesus, she was clinging to him. Now, she was holding him so tight. It's the only time in the Bible where Jesus says, hey, let me go. <laughs> I wish that he would say that to all of us. Hey, Tim, leave me alone. You're, you're pressing it too hard. You know what I mean? But, you know, to me, she's the poster kid for getting contaminated. You know, she's hanging on forever for dear life uh, to Jesus. And I think that's kind of what, you know, he's really after in our lives is to, for us to have that kind of access uh, that kind of freedom, you know, that kind of intimacy. If, if there was ever a word uh, that is important in this day of quarantine and pandemic, it's intimacy. Yeah. There's one person and one person on, for the whole human race. I mean, the whole world's on shutdown. This is a worldwide Sabbath. So we, we separate ourselves from people, but we can draw near to God himself. We can draw near to God himself. Yes. I'll say it again. We can draw near to God himself. That's what he's after. Separating from people, okay, we get that. Drawing near to God, I pray that you get that too. Yes. I pray that, you know, when you look around at everybody and all the signs, stay away, get back six feet, you know, don't get close in your mind say, there is one person I can get close to. There is one person who I can let breathe on me. There is one person who can wrap their arms around me, and I can draw near to him. 
He is the lover of your soul. you got to understand, his whole purpose of his death, burial, and resurrection was for you. Yeah. And you alone. That's why he did it. You were the prize in his eyes. You were the reason why he came. You're the reason why he died. You know, our highest good, our highest joy, our highest fulfillment is found in him. You know, after you've tried everything else in the world that doesn't uh, fulfill you, it's important that you say, Lord, I'm coming back home. I'm going to reconsider Jesus again. In this time of social distancing, I want divine intimacy. I want to come to him and find the reason why I am alive, why I am here, why I uh, exist. I want to know those questions and those answers to those questions. And they're only going to be found in him. You know, the Bible says this, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they will be yeah. white yeah. as snow. Yeah. White as snow. This is what she said. I know what you've done. I know where you've been. I know what you're all about. I know what your compelling issues are all about. Yeah. Let's reason together. And I will turn those issues into righteousness. If you like me. Mm -hmm. If you simply draw near. You know? And that word draw near is that it's extreme closeness to him. And I think it's a perfect justification of this day in which we live between social distancing and divine intimacy. You know, that's where we want to be. You know, so close to him, like this, as I said before, that we get infected with him. We get contaminated by him. You know, I want to have so much of him that I radiate Jesus everywhere. Else. I want to contaminate the whole world with him. Yeah. I want to breathe on the whole world God's love and grace and power and joy. I want to tell the whole world about him because of what he's done for us. Yes. And I want to read the, this uh, portion of the scripture again in Hebrews. And, and after I've shared this, listen to the way uh, he describes it. He says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, oh, that's so good. Mm -hmm. We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he had inaugurated for us through the veil, which is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is why we celebrate Easter. You know, the tomb is empty so that you can be full. You know, Jesus arose from the dead so that you can have life and life eternal. He is the great lover of mankind. He's the great lover of your soul. And just like the uh, uh, disciples did on the road to Emmaus, they processed their pain and loss with him. And he gave them the answers and he gave them hope. And I want to challenge you today, you know, or even this week in this time of, of, of a, a worldwide Sabbath, get alone and start talking with him. You know, maybe you've never taken the time to be with him and really talk to him. He's not answering, asking you to just say a prayer. Talk to him. Talk to him about the things that are on your heart and your mind. And let him speak to you. But that's why he came, to have that kind of fellowship, that kind of intimacy that kind of interaction with the people whom he created. You are his people. He is your creator. And he wants to reveal himself to you. And he did it by covering our sins with his own blood so that we could enjoy and partake the very holiness and presence of God himself. That you and I, now get a little of this, can become the very temple of God himself. That he can dwell in us. Christ in you. The hope of glory. The hope of mankind is Jesus Christ. And it's because of his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. So happy Easter, people. And take the time today to get contaminated by Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Well, worship team, come on. We're going to close with an old Easter hymn. Uh, we don't want you to leave uh, this broadcast without feeling uh, the presence of God 
and one of these old glorious hymns. So uh, we'll come up and we'll close with this.
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, church.